administrator, and one of our guests aren't here yet, but I figure let's start, and when he arrives, we'll just add him, and that way you're not sitting looking at anything. I mean, look at nothing. So, does that sound good? Yeah. Okay. So, our panel, first of all, from Babylon 5, please welcome Commander Sinclair Michael O'Hare. Bring him on, yes. Sliders and ER, but she is best known from Star Trek Deep Space Nine as Lita the Dabo Girl. Please welcome Chase Masterson. And please welcome who else but the wizard? <laughs> No, it's not Charlton Heston, ladies and gentlemen. Ladies and the Wizard of Speed and Time. Let's hear it for Mike Jitlaw. Yes. And Charlton Heston is not going to be here because of the Eleventh Commandment. Thou shalt not show up at Dragon Con. And, uh, no, I, we have. <laughs> we have in lieu of. I should do this. All right. Do it, man. Yes, in lieu of Mr. Heston, we have a special, well, uh, in memory of one of his greatest roles. We have. Where are you? Yes, we have here from the internet. Net goddess, Corgi, warrior, princess, where are you? Approach, approach the table with the sacred loaf and Linnell, the, the legendary Linnell of the internet. Both of these are net goddesses. They are bringing forth. Let's have some applause, please. necessarily ask us where we want our characters to go but um, it was actually really nice because they told me um, hey, <laughs> they told me uh, about I don't know it was a couple years ago it was actually back when we were shooting Bar Association that uh, that Lita would be getting involved with with Rom and that's part of why they wrote Bar Association in the way that, that they did for Lita to be supportive of Rom so they've been cooking up this storyline for quite a long time and uh, and planning on taking me to other places for a long time. So it's kind of nice to see that in process and how, how they've expanded it and, and, you know, done it little by little, you know. I'm happy. Next question. Anybody? Yeah, right there. Mike, what you doing now? Huh. <laughs> <laughs> uh, over 
expecting tremendously. <laughs> I have been touring throughout the world, uh, giving lectures on how to avoid following in my footsteps. Um, to where we are, don't make feature films unless you have a good agent and an attorney. And hopefully the people I've been traveling around Ireland, England, Scotland, Scandinavia, jumped off the highest bridge in the Czech Republic. And uh, by the way, the bungee jumps there, they're different from the American ones. The cords don't stretch. <laughs> Quite a shot, but uh, no, I held on to my camera. The battery went boo! But the camera was taking my hands. So, um, and I'll be showing a lot of that today at 4 o'clock to 5.30. If anyone is still awake by the end of my show, you'll see it! It'll be different. And I'll be surprised. Next question. Yeah. What kind of magic you got to do to get that hair to stand up? <laughs> Nothing, I just went to go see the new Batman movie and it just happened. <laughs> just gel and hairspray, man. Just an abuse. Just an abuse. Yeah, right here in the front. Yeah? Rudy, what, uh, how did you develop the character of Lab Man? Where did he come from? Ah, uh, that's a good question. Actually, that's what we're supposed to be talking about, is how we develop our characters in weird make-believe worlds and bring them to life. But uh, actually, I started off drawing comic books when I was very young, and then I became a magician at age nine and won a bunch of magic contests and got very disappointed in magic because everybody was looking exactly the same and, you know, I mean, literally in top hat and tails and pulling birds out of their butt, and it was, you know, depressing. <laughs> and uh, so uh, at about age 17, I started doing, um, I started developing this character, which was more like my uh, comic book. So now it's uh, sort of a combination of the 1960s Batman and uh, David Copperfield, it's cool. So it's, uh, and we're doing a little talk at 2.30 on that if you want to see, well, a little, a little big talk. Stage show. Big stage show, yeah, hour and a half. And they got the video for us. We'll actually have a show. Yeah. And, uh, and that'll be next door at 2.30 in the, in, the, uh, in the theater. But um, yeah, it just, it makes it more fun for me to do my own thing instead of trying to be David Copperfield. There's already one of him, so. Next question. No, there's plenty of David Copperfields actually in the magic world. Seen any of the magic specials right there. Well, same question that was asked to you, I'd like to ask the rest of the panel. How did you create uh, the Wizard's Feet in Time, and how did uh, Michael Hare and uh, Chase Masterson, how did you enhance your characters? Did you hear that? Well, uh. <laughs> baseball been very, very good to me. <laughs> When, when you create a character, you, this is kind of tough stuff to talk about. Um, I, I drew upon <clears throat> my brothers who were both in the military and, and uh, Commander Sinclair is a military character. And uh, that helped me a lot. And also, your character is always you, so it's your point of view while you're playing the character. What you bring to it has to do with how you would deal with the situation in, uh, in, in, in and that defines your character. I hope that gave a little bit of an explanation. Not much. That's the real answer, what he just said. And Chase, how do you stand out on Star Trek? <laughs> what time did I get in last night? <laughs> okay. Um. How do you stand out? Yeah, I mean, there's been plenty of female characters, but yours definitely stood out. Well, bless you, kind sir. Yeah. Thank you. Um, how do you stand out? Yeah, I guess, what, um, I'm not sure how this ties in with what Michael said, but what, what I feel is that uh, a casting is such an important part of the process that you have to take a real look at who you are within the role and why they hired you and what it is that's special that you bring to the part. And chances are that's what they want you to keep on doing within the context of the storyline. So um, I think it's really important to understand um, the, the, the potentials of a character within opposites, you know? Like Lita was, you know, it could have been like this come on girl and she's this Dabo player and all that. And you know, we all know what they really do for a living, although I don't think Lita does. 
but, mind you, anymore anyway. Lita's really working her way through med school, okay? For real. So, but um, the thing is, is, is you have to understand that, that you know, your potential to play the opposite of, of all those things. And that's why I think I, I, I tried to bring a, a fair amount of innocence and, and integrity to Lita so that there would be more of, a, a, a more roundedness and all of that. And, and, I th and I'm thankful that that's tied in with some of the, th some of the episodes that I've been in. Um, you know, to have compassion and, and uh, like I said, integrity and uh, be able to stand up for what's right and all those newer qualities that are coming into Lita um, that, that, that one might not have expected that do allow a character to expand. You know, you have to allow them to expand you by, by bringing all you can to each episode. Yes. You get Good it? answer. You know what I mean? Yeah. Right down here in front. I think there's a difference in in some ways, but you really hope that you're able to just bring the most amount of real life to any different genre that you do. I mean, science fiction, I think, is broad in a different way than daytime television is broad. You know, daytime television has such a stigma of being, you know, that's why we call it soap opera. Um, and I think it happens a lot, and I think that it's it, the fact that they that they usually use such classically, it's classic people, you know? I, I don't mean that in a good way toward me or anybody else. I just mean that it's, it, it, ex, externals are so important on daytime television that that can sometimes be as far as anything goes, you know? Um, am I making any sense in that? Yes? Yeah. Yuck? Right, you know what I mean? No, that's, why, that's why I don't watch. <laughs> Um, but as far as, as, as nighttime television, such as ER or, um, you know, some of the other nighttime episodics, um, I, I, I'm happy to have been able to participate in those more because you, you just get to be realer, you know, it's more filmic. And it, it, all I can say is, is that as an actor, I guess Michael and, and the rest would, it, you, you guys would tend to agree, right? That you have to really know, you have to really know what genre you're, you're doing. You, you couldn't you couldn't go on and do you know ER kind of work on General Hospital. It just wouldn't work, and certainly vice versa. And that's part of how you get the job is by knowing those things and and working accordingly. You know. I think the sick part is that Mike. I, I just have, having met him for a few days, and myself, I know this for a fact. I think. Uh, our problem might be, can we take the characters a little bit off the screen? I mean, he is the wizard of speed and time all the time. He's cool, you know? And uh, if, if I don't have the hair, I definitely am not. But it is, but it is interesting. It is interesting. <laughs> Next question, right there in the blue. To, to the panel in general, how have you found your characters developing philosophically since you first got them? Yeah, go ahead, Mike. It actually goes back to the beginning. Uh, I was originally a math language major over at UCLA, and I've been called a wizard since I was around 12 years old. I used to invent magicians and go to Hollywood and full Blackstone. Get out of here. Yeah. But it was an amazing time. Uh, I came up with a script and idea while I was uh, making a short film for UCLA. I had to satisfy my art requirement, so I made an animated film. They blew it up to the Academy Awards, and oh, well, this is neat. It's fun to make movies. I made a short film called Speed, won some awards in 69. Then I wrote a script. Uh, oh, a special <laughs> <laughs> uh, I told you. Yes. <laughs> Can I get a sword back? science fiction films, get out of here. <laughs> so I wrote a script called Speed. Big movie, uh, a lot of special effects, kind of a combination of Superman, Flash, and a lot, lot more. 
I was called over to Disney Studios. They were intrigued by the script. They said, number one, nobody's going to make a movie called Speed. <laughs> <laughs> we just love the speeded up effect that you did with your short film, so we want to use it for a TV special. And uh, tell you what, um, maybe you could even be in it and play a little role. And I wound up starring on a Disney show about special effects. Still couldn't get the film made. I didn't have an agent and all the good stuff, so I started making a small $35,000 film about special effects people trying to survive in Hollywood. Producer found me, we were off making it in 35 millimeter, and um, if you ever see the film called The Wizard of Speed and Time, the man who plays the evil, slimy, embezzling, sociopathic producer in the film was my business partner. <laughs> it's a satire in Disney Studios, and talk about art becoming reality. In the film, everybody was named after cigarettes because they were always burning somebody. That is the bad guys. And so we've got uh, Lucky Straker, Paul Mall, Virginia Slim, uh, Chester Fielding. Uh, the uh, said evil business partner or evil actor did not want to play Paul Mall. He wanted to play uh, somebody he hated in Las Vegas named Harvey Bookman. Whoever that was. My apologies to all the Harvey Bookmans of the world. Um, what happened during filming? Our film was essentially a satire of true experiences at Disney Studios. Uh, my friends over there called Auschwitz or Duckau. <laughs> not the happiest kingdom. But as we're finishing the film, we named our studio in the film Hollywood Studios, clever. And all of a sudden, the, the studio that we're filming at, Coppola Studios, Zojo, changed its name to Hollywood Studios. The man who's managing it was Harvey Bookbinder. And of course, Disney opened a new arm with this recent arm called Hollywood Pictures, so it's a dee 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 dee. And there's a lot, lot more, but it's a good comment sense of art becoming reality, becoming art becoming a reality you don't really want anymore, but it was, it was interesting. And uh, that's enough. <laughs> Next question. Uh, right here in front. So, uh, Michael O'Hare, you had completely creative control over Sinclair. What would you change? I would have uh, brought more humor to the character. I had a lot of expositional responsibilities. And, uh, didn't give me much of an opportunity to use humor, and I would have brought more humor. Next question. Uh, over here on the side. Yes. Mr. Titlock, who owns all of those goodies, those Disney goodies in the collector? Oh, in the Mickey Mouse? Yes. Uh, that was a, a small thing I did for Disney. Uh, it was for the 50th anniversary of Mickey Mouse. They wanted me to show off paper cutouts of Disney toys, and I said, I'd love to do something in live action, guys. Maybe a guy who collects Mickey Mouse memorabilia, and he works in a Mickey Mouse dental pool, winds up in a Mickey Mouse psychiatrist's office with a thousand toys marching up. Oh, okay, you can do that. Oh, no, great, how do I do this? Well, the Disney have archives, no problem. No, they only had a few things. They were just trying to gather an archive, so I went to everyone I knew at Disney, at Disney Studios, mocked up things. I don't own any of that, uh, no Mickey Mouse. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, I actually saw the first Mickey Mouse show back when it first came on. It was, uh, none of it was our own. A lot of it had to be created for the show. And it was all filmed not on a Disney soundstage because we couldn't, uh, we didn't have the budget. Disney spends about $7,000 a second for animation. And we had uh, not much more than that to film three minutes of animation. We filmed it in a friend's apartment up the street from me. Three people <laughs> animating a thousand toys. You'll see it later on. Five o'clock. Four o'clock. Four o'clock. Four o'clock. Next, way back there. Black hey, shirt. Uh, Rudy. Yeah. I understand magicians have to do different things and keep innovating the field, but what exactly was it that gave you the idea to drive a nail over your nose? I'll do that. <laughs> when, when I was a kid, I used to go to the sideshow. I, I and it's so sad that the sideshows aren't out there anymore. You know, the freak shows. You know, because uh, you know people thought that the freaks were being you know, uh, abused and that it was a terrible thing to be, you know, have all these people coming in and looking at the freaks. And But, but the freaks loved it. I mean, they, they made a great living and it was show business. And if you talk to any, uh, any freak nowadays, they're very sad that they can't get work because of crusading people stopping these freak shows. Well, when I was nine years old, I went to a, uh, a very small county fair uh, freak show, side show, and I, I went in there and I stayed there all day. I paid my dollar or 50 cents and I stayed there all day. And they got to like me, and I watched the acts over and over and over, and Otis the Frog Boy <laughs> taught me the human blockhead. And, uh, and it's not something I talk about because um, I, if you see my show, I try to make it look completely fake. I have someone sign the nail, and I'm, I'm doing all this crazy stuff to really make it look fake so people wonder about it. But it is a real thing. Uh, Otis the Frog Boy used to put a, uh, 
an ice, hmm? an ice pick, yeah, uh, into his face, and then take the ice pick out and throw it, and it would stick into the floor. And, uh, and that's how I learned it. <laughs> I learned it with an ice pick. And when I was nine years old, and uh, kids don't try this at home. And uh, but everybody thought the ice pick was going into the handle, so it was it was one of those things. Uh, if you, you try know, it, don't sneeze. Yeah, absolutely. Oh. You could nail someone to the chair. It's very dangerous. <laughs> and uh, I may actually do that in my panel. I brought a nail, so if you want to see that up close and, and personal. But so what I did was, uh, yeah, I, I took it from the uh, freak show and made it into a magic trick. And uh, it's one of those things that uh, I try to make people desperately believe it's fake. You know, like. I did a show in Monte Carlo uh, a year ago for Prince Rainier, and afterwards we have, you know, we have, we literally have dinner with Prince Rainier and Princess Stephanie, and and, uh, and the first thing the prince asked, he goes, uh, that nail thing is fake. Oh yeah, Prince, yeah, oh yeah, it's yeah. fake. And uh, otherwise they just think you're a real, they think I'm Otis the Brock boy. So, uh, <laughs> right here. Uh, Chase, what is the most difficult scene you've done in Deep Space Nine from the perspective of maybe some physical reality around you not being there that was going to be added in later? Something that made it hard to be your character for the scene? Hmm. Something that was going to be added in later? Well, not necessarily, but anything that made it very difficult for you to be in character for that particular act. Hmm. That's an interesting question. Um, it, I think that there's always the possibility of there having to be something else that you need to serve you. Um, when you're working, if only because sometimes, you know, when you're doing a close-up, for instance, you know, if the other actor is doing the scene with you but standing behind the camera in some way, or, you know, there's always, you know, grips and people and lighting and booms and mics and everything, that, that a lot of stuff that you really have to ignore, you know, and so sometimes when you're doing a close-up and you, you, you want it to be as intimate as as possible because the camera is that close. You, um, I, I mean, I think that's, you know, possibly an answer to what you're saying. Uh, special effects wise, I've never really had that on Deep Space Nine. I've had that on other shows, had to um, imagine things. Um, I had that when I did that series, uh, Showtime Nighttime, uh, it was all blue screen. You guys know what blue screen is? Yeah. yeah. And uh, that was all done on blue screen. It was a whole series done on blue screen. And, and a couple other, you know, films and stuff. Um, as an actor, though, I, I guess maybe you guys will agree, it's, it's my job, you know what I mean? <laughs> it's part of the course. I mean, pretend is, is, is the deal. That's, that's, that's normal, pretend, you know? I mean, like, I remember feeling like on last Halloween, oh, thank God I could be myself today. <laughs> You know, because I didn't have anything else to do that day. You know what I mean? So I think pretending is it's sort of just, just what we do. You get your mind in that head and that mindset. You guys agree? Yeah, yeah absolutely. Well, the thing about actors is that they aren't afraid to have fun. You, you've never thrown away your childhood. You brought it along for the ride. And you can show it off. It's, it's even more fun to share it with people. Right there. Chase, I was, two questions. I was wondering how you describe your experience with the show thus far, you know, how you've enjoyed it, or whatever, and uh, afterwards, you know, after DS9 is gone, would you move into another science fiction role, or would you rather do something else? I would be very happy in staying in science fiction, um, indefinitely, or, or at least as part of my career. Um, and there are other things I'd like to do, but I, I'd be certainly fine if, if that's the way that it works out. Um, science fiction is a very faithful medium. Great <laughs> and, uh, and I, I find a lot of fun in that. I, I enjoy stuff like this a lot, and, and knowing that there's such an intent, uh, you know, just such an intent fan base, I guess. Um, what was your first question? <laughs> how, how would you describe your experience with the show? Oh, um, I like it a lot. It's a really warm group of people. Deep Space Nine has a, a real good, um, real good amount of chemistry in the cast and crew. Um, Voyager has that also. Voyager perhaps even has more fun on the set. Deep Space Nine, you know, we have fun, but it's more of a serious group. I think everybody says that. Nana would say that. Anybody you you asked. Um, but Voyager's just a cut up. I mean, Bob Picardo. Need I say more? You know. Um, but it's been good, it's been a good fit. Other shows that I've done, I, I felt at home, but not quite so, like, hey, I belong here, you know? And I think that's part of, um, I think that's two things. I think that's 
the ability of um, Rick Berman and Ira Bear and Bobby D and all the other people who hire people to find out to see what is the kind of chemistry that puts a good team together. That's first. And I think also it's the fact that the, the team has been together for such a long time. I mean, they're in their sixth season now. Um, and a lot of them worked on TNG before that, crew-wise. So it's, it, it, part of television, I think, is creating a family feel and you get better work done. All the way at the back. I have no preference uh, between the two. They both have advantages and disadvantages. When you're on stage, you have the advantage of a live audience. Uh, but sometimes you have to play things a little broader. Uh, with the camera, you can be incredibly subtle. But you don't have the advantage of a live audience there. So, um, I have no preference. Next question. Uh, right there. Um, Michael and Chase, what sort of, have you had any formal theatrical or just acting training in general? And if not, how did you get your start? It shows, huh? <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, I had no training. I uh, just uh, banged the film had to start. I mean, I, I had no fear when I was a kid of getting up in front of stage and talking. I can talk forever, obviously. But, um, no, actually in the film, the, the Wizard movie, uh, I was playing myself. In fact, some people wonder why, you know, you got to be an ego trip of all time. Well, yes, it was. It was planned as that. In fact, at the end of the film, we're all commenting, laughing about our egos. But one of the reasons I play myself in the movie is when you start, do a feature film in Los Angeles, if you name a character, um, a name of anybody that actually exists in L.A., they can sue you. There are 19 and a half million people in Los Angeles. And since I'm the only Jetlov in the whole United States, Mike Jetlov, uh, our family's just, there's just four of us here. Uh, it was pretty safe. And uh, unlike, uh, what was it, uh, Ralph Hinckley and the greatest American hero, uh, right after uh, Hinckley tried to assassinate the president, uh, they had to, was it Hinckley? Yeah. They had to block out the Good friend of mine. he announced it on the TV show. So, Hi, I'm Ralph. <laughs> Training, just bang, get up and do it. That was it. Uh, I will not be acting in any more films. And once was enough. It was fun. The uh, next movie is uh, a Viking time travel film called Bjorn to be Wild. We'll get a real actor. <laughs> oh, it's, it's like a Monty Python's version of where Santa Claus came from. I want to thank uh, Cross Swords, by the way. They furnished that Viking sword. It was really neat. Yes, one more. Chase. Training. Otis the Frog Boy. <laughs> I uh, studied at Juilliard. Oh, well, well, what are you doing? <laughs> and I they studied... teach you how to pound a spike in your face at Juilliard? Sanford Meisner, Ooh. who uh, taught me the little bit I do. The little bit I do know, he taught me. Basically, I, I didn't like do the regular high school thing. I mean, I went to a regular high school, but I, I didn't ever go to a football game, never had a date till I was 19. Um, I was just always, always working, always working at working. I got my degree in acting from UT. 
um, and, uh, and, then, and then moved out and, and have worked with some really wonderful um, coaches and uh, in, some, in some other wonderful classes um, since then. That's it. Which you Austin. Okay. This guy right here. This guy right here in the second row. Michael O'Hare. Question for you, sir. Uh, what would, in your next role, like whenever that is, your next project, what would, what would you like that role to be and why? Uh, what was the question? What would I like my next role to be and why? Uh, geez, that's a very hard question to answer. Uh, I just would like to be a good part, you know. Uh, that's all I've got to say about that. I just re really like it to be a good part. I'd like to be the first heterosexual Batman, actually. <laughs> <laughs> when did he come out of the closet, exactly? Uh, right here, in the front. Uh, and Kyle, what's your opinion of the fandom? Fandom on the internet. I love it. I, I'm, but Mike and I were talking about it last night. We're both, uh, he's warning me because I'm going into the psychotic stages of it. I'm on, I'm on the net a couple hours every night, and I think it's uh, a couple hours. A couple hours. <laughs> <laughs> a couple, like, eight, nine. Uh, and uh, I think it's a great medium. I think it's uh, really fantastic. We're going to be seeing some great stuff in the next couple years. And uh, there's already some great stuff out there, but, uh, but it's going to get better and better. I'm always stretching the envelope. Somebody... There's, uh, I mentioned before, there's three Chinese curses. Uh, may you live in interesting times, uh, which actually means may you be so preoccupied with things you're doing now you forget about the things you really need to do. Um, so like everybody I know who has a Mac, you just, or everything gathers around you. Uh, may you come to the attention of the authorities. <laughs> and may someone give you your own news group on the internet. <laughs> 70,000 subscribers and 1,600 email messages. Uh, I've kind of laid low for a while, but I'm coming back in. Done a lot of fun stuff on the internet, uh, making comedy posts, hundreds and hundreds of these things, including three pictures you can cross your eyes and finally see the little words inside of it and it says, get a life. <laughs> and much more fun. Movies pretty soon. Uh, several people, John Hudgens has made an incredible web page for my movie with a lot of pictures pretty soon. We'll have quick time movies and many more pictures. It's all free. I've got a, a font for anybody who has a um, oh, Macintosh. Cool. We'll do font. You highlight it and it changes to 40 other languages. Uh, Arabic, Armenian, uh, uh, pretty soon Tolkien, uh, Cyrillic, uh, already runic. I've got the original runic, not the one everybody's using now. And I've got some great Chase Masterson uh, yeah. downloads. Wrapped in I like Chase on, uh, I, I actually like Chase. <laughs> when you were on uh, Family Matters, I really loved you. You were great on Family Matters. What? Oh, that was that Urkel kid, I'm sorry. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much. Anyway, um, just kidding. Uh, no, I was going to say, um, I love the net stuff. Um, I, I, had a, I threw a party last week, actually. Well, um, Sean Redlitz from the Sci-Fi Channel. Do you know who he is? Is he here, Sean? Yes, Sean. Yay, Sean Redlitz! I don't know where he is, but um, we threw a party last week on the internet. I suggested it be a stag party, but then they said, no, maybe a bachelor party. And then they watered it down to being a prenuptial party for Ram and Lita last week for the wedding, a couple weeks ago. And I loved the party. It was on the net. It was, we were all chatting online, and I just thought, you know, this is great. I don't have to worry about DWI. I don't have to worry about secondhand smoke, and there's no line for the bathroom. <laughs> It is amazing how many people, it's on the internet, if you, uh, I mean, you can get in contact with people. I mean, it's just a pretty amazing thing on the internet. Some, somehow they'll take email and not think you're a stalker uh, more than, am I uh, revealing myself too much? <laughs> <laughs> but it is amazing, I mean, people that, I mean, I, I used to get all these weird phone calls and uh, I would just, you know, erase them, but I actually sometimes <laughs> will answer the email because it's, it's kind of fun to see how far it goes, you know? <laughs> Don't email me. Don't email me. Next question. All in capital letters. Always send in capital letters. Right, right there. Uh, mustache. Uh, Jason Michael O'Hare. Um, you, you had two questions. Uh, one was about uh, the character. Which episode would best define your character that you play on Bad Five and on Deep Space Nine?
see that in every panel. I always thought these looked a little bit like proctological <laughs> We're learning way too much about Michael. <laughs> it's always the quiet ones you have to watch out for. Uh, uh, Sky Full of Stars is my episode that I is my favorite and uh, in the first season and I think it showed the most about uh, the character Sinclair. That's my answer. Thank you. Next question. Oh, oh sorry. Oh, sorry, Chase. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. The big haired guy got it wrong. Okay? I don't think it's, um... <laughs> I don't think it's been written yet. No, I, I know. I, I know. I, I do. Um, I think maybe Bar Association. Um, because... Even though it was a little while back, it was it really the, the uh, sticking up for, you know, um, the integrity of the situation with the strike was really important, I think, to Lita. And, and it could have cost Lita a lot, and Lita still did the right thing, which I thought was a nice element. Now, next question, right here in the front. Yeah, we heard of uh, Mike's, um, Mike's uh, new movie. Uh, are there any of the rest of you guys uh, about the movie? <laughs> I got one last night. Yeah. You're the first to know. I haven't called my mom yet. Seriously, I haven't called my agent back yet. Um, I just got the message last night. Um, yeah, it's called. Oh, this is. Uh, it's uh, sometimes they come back for more. It's a Stephen King. There's a what is there? There's already sometimes they come back. Yeah. Sometimes I, they come back again. This is for more. The next one will be too much. I don't know. But anyway, it's, it's going to be a neat film. I'm working with, uh, I'm one of the leads with uh, Faith Ford from Murphy Brown. And uh, I'm real excited about it. Start probably next week. I'm actually, uh, I'm actually doing a movie with uh, Jenna Jameson. It's a Star Trek thing. It's, uh, it's called Deeper Space Nine. And, uh, <laughs> Uh, I'm actually doing a TV series version of my show, which is going to be uh, for uh, fall 98, uh, sort of a Lab Man adventures, like uh, Pee Wee Herman meets uh, Lab Man, I guess. Really, really great. Uh, and I fought for it for a year to get the right people on board, so I'm very happy about that. And, uh, and that's that. Yeah. Way, in, way in the back. Oh, sorry. Uh, there's a project called The Heretic. It's being shot in England, and uh, it looks very strongly possible it's going to happen, and I would be involved in that. What about Bjorn to be wild? Is that, is that real? Oh, yeah. All right. <laughs> yeah. Those rules are and there is a Lab Man movie being talked about, and it's, but it, I don't say anything until it's definite, so. Way, way, way in the back with the glasses. Okay. Yeah, uh, Mike Chetlaw. Uh I understand you're the man in the green jacket. Well, where did the green jacket come from? <laughs> I, uh, I was going to make a movie back in 1970, and I needed, I had several friends who looked sort of like me, so it was going to be a guy going between time, meeting himself over and over again, the ultimate ego trip. Uh, I needed six suits of clothes that all looked alike. Went downtown, they had a sale on these green jackets for $2 a piece. <laughs> they looked good on film, and the uh, film didn't get made, but I kept wearing these things, and I became known as the man in the green jacket. Uh, easy to find in the crowd. And I like green, so. And he's a damn handsome man in it, isn't he? Oh. So we're going so to take, take a couple more questions. And then after this, by the way, uh, Chase is going to do some autographing here. And, uh, and then I'm going to be right next door in the theater at 2.30. I have to make sure that the video is running. Right after me in the theater next door is the incredible Mike Jitlock. And uh, yeah, the man, the man. So we'll take a couple more questions here. We'll give Chase some time to do some autographing before the uh, the spawn presentation. So uh, we'll take two more questions and way in the back. Cause, and, and if you have a good question and I, I didn't see you, wave your hand really wildly because then I'll pick you. But you way in the back. Question for you, folks. Uh, this is for the whole panel. Do you folks ever get just sick and tired of being recognized in public? <laughs> Do 
we get sick and tired of getting recognized in public. Um, Ooh, I actually have that, I have that problem only in America, um, it's amazing. Television is an amazing thing. When we did the first Fox special, I've been on. I've done a bunch of magic specials, but I did the first Fox special. You get tired of being recognized and put on camera all the time. But... And we did the first Fox special last year, and then two weeks later, I was at a Hollywood, uh, Planet Hollywood opening in Hawaii, and walking down the red carpet and hearing people say, I mean, "Television is a powerful thing." But in Australia, our show was uh, one of the top-rated shows of the year. So in Australia, I literally can't walk down the street or go in a restaurant or, and I'll tell you, it's really, it's great and impressive, you know, to be with a girl and, and be right But I'll tell you, then, and, and it's really nice because fans, you know, I love fans, I love talking to fans, but um, but then you do get the drunk psychos, you know, you, get, you know, in front of McDonald's at two in the morning, coming up, hey, I love you, man, I love you, and you're like, oh, thanks, you know, hey, have a beer with me, man. No, that's okay, I, I, you know, I'm really gonna go, hey, screw you, asshole, yeah. You know, and, but, you know, so, so you go through all that, but, but it's fun, and then it's not fun if it gets to a start. I can't even imagine someone like um, Schwarzenegger or uh, Chase Masterson, you know. It would it'd be very crazy to be them. It must be crazy. And, and here at the, um, at, the, at the convention, I think we have that problem more than anywhere else. It's... Nope. <laughs> I'm trying to get recognized or anything. <laughs> uh, actually, one thing happened when I was in London. Uh, uh, I was videotaping. It's odd because wonderful things tend to happen in front of this little Sony. And uh, I'll plug. I was videotaping the tube, the subway system, showing how it is incredibly convoluted. There's wonderful um, mosaics in the walls. Zooming through there, I contrasted it with the uh, Rosetta Stone. Going through the subways, down escalators. What are the odds that I'm going to be in London in the Piccadilly area? There are like three or four subway systems that meet in one place, going down the right passageway, over to the right train at the right time. Train comes in, there are six cars in the train, two doors in each one. I have the camera on, I've gone through this whole maze, into the train, and there are two people sitting there with wizard t-shirts they handmade. I like that. It really happens. It, and I did not set it up, so it's on video too, so somebody else show it. Wow. And we have one, one more question, and if you've got a really good one, go crazy, man. Way in the back, we gotta go for the shadow. Way in the back, man, or the Green Hornet today. Yes. Green Hornet. Rudy, are you gonna perform in Vegas any time? <laughs> you know, I've been offered in incredibly satanic money to go to Vegas and be there forever, but uh, I, I, don't, I don't wanna, I, I would prefer to keep doing different stuff all the time. You know, that's the challenge. I love, uh, you know, getting buried in a giant hourglass and you know, all this weird stuff that I did on my specials. And you can't do that if you're in Vegas just doing the same show all the time. But if they up the money, no. I mean, I, I, my, my best friend, or one of my better magic friends, um, Lance Burton, who does a great uh, classic dove act, and I've known Lance forever, and he loves, he loves being in Vegas. He lives in Vegas. And um, he has a hundred million dollar offer. And, to stay in Vegas for 13 years. And he was like, yeah, okay, I'll take it. <laughs> and um, so it's it's a weird time for Magic because, you know, um, Copperfield's on the Forbes list every year, like number four or five, and Siegfried and Roy are, you know, on you know number 20 or 30. And, and so it's a good time to be a magician and, uh, you know, sell your soul and go to Vegas forever. But I'm, not right now. Maybe in uh, five years when I have no more ideas. So you guys were a great crew. Again, 2.30 will be next door my thing. Four o'clock, Wizard of Speed and Time. Chase is going to be autographing here. Is that correct, Chase? I will, and a portion of the proceeds today goes to um, the, uh, the charity that my fan club supports, which is Caring for Babies with AIDS, which is a house where um, kids who are HIV positive and, and who have AIDS live in Los Angeles, and, and they take care of them. So that's where part of this will be going. And come up and meet us. And thanks, guys.